We serve a God of new things, amen? A new heart, a new life. I want to thank our guys for leading us this morning. Uh, so faithful in leading us in worship each and, and every week. I want to thank you guys for your prayers. Uh, for our team from Lesotho, got back uh, yesterday afternoon. And so thank you for uh, your prayers for our team. And we're excited to hear uh, back from them in the coming weeks. Uh, already we've heard a great testimony of what God's done through uh, that partnership uh, with the valley there in Lesotho, Africa. At the end of our service today, we're excited to gather around the Lord's table. And so we'll conclude this morning. Uh, by taking of the Lord's Supper at the end of uh, this service. And so very excited for what the Lord's doing. Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn with me to the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke. New things, right? We're, in a, we're still in a new year, like we're still in the newness of it. Three weeks into it, they say that this is a critical moment for those who have set New Year's resolutions. They say that if you can get to 21 days, I've just, I've, I remember there's nothing spiritual about this. I've just read before that uh, if you can get to 21 days of a discipline, I've heard if you can get to 21 days of a discipline, uh, I think the percentages, I think your chances uh, rise like 70% uh, for it to stick, you know, in your life. But usually this is the time when we all kind of come back to reality, right? Three weeks into the new year. So frustration has set in, nothing has changed, we're still eating bad food and we're not exercising, right? So, so, so the third week of the new year can sometimes be, well, back to normal. But yet we desire change, right? Every one of us, we desire change. And, and it's almost as if the Lord has instilled in us that desire for something more. Our tagline here is River Oak Church, live for something more, that there's something beyond, you know, just what this world is living for. New things, a new life, a new heart, new passions, new desires, new uh, priorities. But let's be real, sometimes even New Year's can let us down. It reminds me of a story. <laughs> I sense your excitement. It was New Year's Eve, and a lady and her husband were going to go out that night and celebrate New Year's Eve. They're going to go to a nice dinner, but uh, again, New Year's can be a late night. And so she said, well, I'm going to take a nap. I'm going to take a nap in the afternoon. That way, you know, I don't get tired tonight. I'm going to stay up a little bit longer. So she took a nap. She woke up, grabbed her husband, and said, husband, I just had the am most amazing dream. He said, what was it? She said, I just dreamed that you gave me a diamond necklace for New Year's. She said, do you think that will come true? He said, well, you're going to have to wait till tonight and see. He said, tonight you will know what that dream means. So they go out to dinner, have a great night. They, they, they finish the New Year's. He hands her a package. Her heart drops. She opens up the package, and inside is a brand new book entitled How to Interpret Your Dreams. All right, so Luke chapter 3. <laughs> It can let us down, right? Like, we can be let down, and we can be frustrated, right? Okay, well, th back to normal, things normal, right? And, and sometimes the enemy can play in on that, you know, as well as, as, as putting it back on us. You know, sometimes we're like, okay, this is going to be a new year, and things are going to change, and things are going to be different. And the reason we become so frustrated and discouraged is because we're trying to usher and change in our own efforts, you know, determination and willpower. But we know that when the Bible speaks of change, true change, uh, that goes beyond determination and willpower. It's a heart change. And when God changes the heart of an individual, he changes the direction of a life. New things. You know, I'm in a new thing right now. I'm coaching uh, five-year-old basketball right now. So please be praying for me. Uh, about a month ago, I was, I was in my quiet time, and I remember praying for patience. Be careful when you pray for patience, all right? Praying for patience. And so I'm realizing now that the Lord's answer to me for praying for patience is no longer am I just surrounded by my five-year-old. I now have seven others five-year-olds in front of me as well, and God is teaching me patience. We had our first game yesterday. I thought it was pretty good. I only got one technical during the game, five-year-old. Um, <laughs> But the ref missed the call. Dude walked. It was blatant. He walked, and we should have won the game, and I'm protesting. All right, Luke chapter 3. Five-year-old basketball. It's bad when you get kicked out of your father's own church over five. I didn't have, that didn't happen. I'm just joking. So we come to the series on Jesus, right? If you were here with us last week, you know, I shared a little bit of my heart that, man, as we go into the New Year's, exciting things are happening. And it's true. I mean, I've, uh, it's, it's, it's crazy to think, you know, 20 years of existence as a church. We're celebrating our 20th anniversary uh, as we move into February. 11 years for me personally uh, as the pastor of this church. And I shared last Sunday, I, I've never been more excited. When you look at what God's doing, when you look at the team that he's brought together, our staff, full-time, part-time, our volunteers that are serving, our, just our body. I've never been more excited. When I look at, again, the potential of the new building, and I think of the potential of even this room here, like I've never been more excited. But as I shared last Sunday, there is, a, there is a caution there as well. Because 
how easy it is, as we saw in the text of Luke 2, to lose Christ even in the celebration of Christ, to make it about other things. And so my heart's cry for the new year, I can tell you, is just to keep the main thing the main thing, to keep Jesus in the place that he's called us to keep him. I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles and stand with me in reverence to reading God's Word. Very cool passage this morning as we look at Luke chapter 3. John the Baptist. Not a lot of time is given to John the Baptist by Luke, but we know that this is now setting the stage for the earthly ministry of Christ. John the Baptist being the final of the Old Testament prophets. When you think about it, he's really the connection from the Old Testament to the New Testament. When you think about it, right, I mean, here is the one prophesied in Luke 1. We know that there in in, in the temple, Zacharias, his father, is given the great prophecy of the angel that you and your wife Elizabeth, although you are advanced in your years, you will give birth to a child. You've prayed for a child. God has heard your prayer. Such a beautiful passage there in Luke 1 that the Lord has heard your cry and has given you a child. It's the prophecy of John the Baptist. We know there's prophecy of John the Baptist 700 years earlier by the prophet Isaiah. We know there's prophecy of John the Baptist even 400 years earlier by the final prophet, of the Old, or at least written in the Old Testament, Malachi. And so all of this, again, fulfillment of prophecy as the forerunner of the Messiah, the one who would set the stage preaching true change that is only found in a heart of repentance. Luke chapter 3, listen to the words that Luke gives us concerning the beginning of the earthly ministry of Jesus. Here it is in Luke chapter 3, beginning verse 1. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, what you're going to find here are seven names, okay, in chapter 1. They're very significant, very historical. Seven names that you can go back in history and find. And so we know Luke being a physician, he's writing this almost like an investigative reporter. He wants to make sure, as he tells us in the first four verses of Luke 1, that we have certainty of who this Jesus is. These are not fables. These are not make-believe stories that this happened. And he said, I'm going to show you how it happened by providing historical proof of those who were ruling. And so the first five names are non-Jewish. The first five names, Caesar is the one obviously over it all. The next four are the sons of Herod. A tetrarch, you're going to see that is one-fourth. We know that when King Herod the Great died, he divided the kingdom into four sections. So the four names after Caesar are the four sons of Herod. Then the final two names are the religious leaders. Annas and Caiaphas, we know, are the high priests there in Israel. The Bible says this. Five names. Now, in the 15th year, the reign of Tiberius, Caesar, he's the one of it all, Pontius Pilate, being governor of Judea, now the four sections, Herod, being tetrarch, one-fourth of Galilee, his brother, Philip, tetrarch, one-fourth of Ituria, region of Trac... Trac... Someone say it? Close enough. Here we go. And Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, one-fourth, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John. Don't miss that phrase. You're going to see that all throughout Old Testament writings when God called a prophet. That the word of God came. He's not saying that scripture came to John the Baptist. He's saying that God's calling came to John the Baptist to preach a message of repentance. What does he say? And he went out to the region around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of Isaiah, the prophet saying, he now quotes Isaiah 40, and it says this, The voice of the one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough ways smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Join with me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the true word of God. Lord, this is history. Lord, we're reading your story that is played out in history. That, Lord, this isn't just make-believe. That, Lord, we can go back and track 2,000 years ago with these specific names and see the context in which Jesus entered into this world. In the darkest of times, our Savior came. So, Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, that you're a God of new things. That you're a God of a new heart, of a new life, of a new destination, new priorities, new passions, new purpose. And so, Lord... May you take us deeper to not just go through the motions of our lives and church, but to daily go deeper into a relationship of the one that we read about, who came, who lived, who died, who rose again, the one who lives within us. May Jesus be glorified. That is our prayer in our lives, in our church. May the name of Jesus be lifted high. We pray it, we ask it, and all God's people said, amen. Amen. You may be seated. 
you know, I remember thinking to myself as a kid growing up, man, Baptist, right? I mean, we're, we're in good company. I mean, the, the greatest of all prophets, right? He was a Baptist. So if John was a Baptist, then it's good that we're a Baptist, right? That's the way I would think as a little kid. Now, we know that this isn't a denomination, right? We know that this is a reference to John the baptizer. He is John the baptizer. Have you ever thought about this? Why is John baptizing? What is baptism, right? What do we celebrate? We've got a baptism service coming up uh, in February. And so, again, it's something that you'll hear more about. We'll talk more about. Love to meet with those that God is stirring in baptism. But what is the meaning of baptism? Well, we know, right? The New Testament meaning of baptism is what? Public identification, public profession of the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's a picture in baptism. What is the picture? It's the picture of Jesus. It's the picture of death, burial, and what? Resurrection. Okay, so John is baptizing. But Jesus has not died. Jesus has not been buried. Jesus has not rose again. So why is John baptizing? It's pretty interesting. We're going to look at the words of John this morning because he lays it out for us. We know that those who were Gentiles who are entering into the Jewish religion, into Judaism, came to religion through baptism. And so a Gentile who is entering into the Jewish faith, what are they saying? They're saying, I need to be washed of you know, my corruption. I need to be washed of uh, my idolatry. I need to be washed of my heresy as I make a covenant with the God of Israel, as I make a covenant with the one true God. But this is before Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And so what was happening is this. This was falling right in line with what John was preaching. What was John preaching? John was preaching that there was a road that leads to salvation, and the road cannot be bypassed. The road that leads to salvation is a heart of repentance. John preached it. Jesus preached it. Paul preached it. Peter preached it. The entire Bible preaches the same message, that when we come to faith, two sides of the same coin, faith and repentance, That it's the work of God that happens simultaneously in the life of the believer. It's a recognition of repentance, what? Seeing my sins the way God sees my sins. And it's what? Turning from my sins. It's a turn from the mind, but it's a turn in even the attitude of the heart in the way that I see my sins, in the way that I see it. I see it the way God sees it. And so it's interesting here what's happening. I mean, these were Jewish people, and here is John preaching to them that what? Blessed are the poor in spirit. What is the poor in spirit? The poor in spirit are those who are spiritually bankrupt. That before someone can truly respond to Almighty God and the gospel message, they've got to realize how truly spiritual bankrupt they are. That they bring nothing to the table. That there is no good works. There is no religion. There is no ordinance or ceremony. That all of our righteousness, as the Bible describes, is filthy wrath before a holy God. So here is John preaching this, that even your heritage, son of of Abraham, these were Jewish people acknowledging that, hey, I, I must come to God even as a Gentile, as a Gentile would come to faith. That I'm not in some special category because of the lineage that I was born into. I'm not in some special category because my father's father, father, father was in the line of Abraham. No, what does John say? It's a heart of repentance. And you can't bypass the road to salvation. And we want to skip it so many times. It comes natural, right? Okay, hey, I'll profess Jesus. I'll pray a prayer. But life change? I'll get baptized. But letting go of some pet sins here that I've held on for a minute, uh, that's a whole different story. But what you find in Scripture is it's never separated, right? It's never separated. The, 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 the message of the gospel is what? A heart that recognizes what? That I'm guilty before a holy God and that I can do nothing to solve my greatest problem. That only Christ can do it. And he's done it. He came, he lived, he died, and he rose again. And so what you find here is John preaching a message of repentance. And he's really the first survivalist, right? I mean, the Bible tells us that he lives out in the wilderness. You ever seen those shows on TV, Survivalists? When we first got married, my wife used to love watch Man vs. Wild. Do y'all remember that? Bear Grylls, you know what I'm talking about? Crazy stuff. Like, he would eat stuff that I'm like, just, I'm just going to die before I'd eat that stuff right there. I saw him sleep in the carcass of a camel. Anyway, it was gross stuff. It's, it's a survivalist. And so I'm intrigued by this, that here is John for 30 years out in the wilderness, but now the voice of God calls upon him. The word of God calls John to now go preach a message of repentance. Listen to how Matthew describes him. Matthew 3, 1 through 3. It says, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And here's the message, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And so here's Matthew affirming that here is John, this John spoken of 700 years earlier by the prophet Isaiah. Listen to how Jesus described Matthew 11, verse 9, Jesus says this, But what did you go out and see? A prophet. Yes, I say to you, more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face. He will prepare the way before you. But listen to what Jesus says. Verse 11, Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of a woman, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. So of all the prophets of, of, of God's word, right? You think about it, right? We're talking, what, Ezra, Jeremiah, I mean, Isaiah. You go through Malachi, Nathan, Samuel. I mean, all of the prophets of God. Jesus affirms John the Baptist is the greatest of them all. Why? Well, think about what his assignment was. What was his assignment? He had been chosen specifically to usher in the coming Messiah. It was he who was chosen to preach a message of repentance and that now the Messiah is coming. The Savior is coming to seek and to save those who are lost. He's coming. He's coming. The Bible describes him as a forerunner. What's a forerunner? Well, 2,000 years ago, again, uh, royalty never arrived at a destination without an announcement. Not only did they ever arrive to a destination without an announcement, there was always someone who went to prepare the way. You think about it. There were those who would go out and say, let's make sure the roads are clear. Let's make sure that the mountains are clear. Let's make sure that when the caravan of royalty enters into the city, that the forerunner has gone out to prepare the way, to clear the way. And so you see the symbolism of what's happening here. John the Baptist as the forerunner preparing the way for the coming king. Let's jump back and look at what it says, verse 1 and 2. Now in the 15th year, the reign of Tiberius Caesar. And then he names these four leaders. And then he moves down into chapter 2, and he talks about the religious leaders. So what is Luke doing? He's giving us the context of the world in which Jesus arrived. And what do you find? These were dark times in the lives of God's people. These were hard times in the lives of God's people. Okay, go back 400, 400 years since they had heard a word from the Lord. I mean, you talk about oppression. The Roman government had come in. I mean, they're, they're, they are looking for a savior. Now, obviously, their idea of a savior was a little bit different than what Jesus was coming to do. But they were oppressed. These were dark times. But sometimes what? The darkest hour gives way to the light. It's the same in our lives. And look at what happens here. The Bible says that the word of God, verse 2, came to John. Just like the prophets of old, the word of God came to John. John has now been called out to preach a message. What is the message? Look at verse 3. It's a message of repentance. He went to all the region around the Jordan. Here it is, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. That word preaching is interesting. It basically means someone, a herald, who announces with a loud voice what his superior has ordered him to announce. That God had blessed you. God has chosen him to make this announcement. I consider myself a herald. What I mean by that is this. This is not my message. This is God's message. Can I get an amen? Amen? So if you're mad at the message, don't get mad at the messenger. My prayer every week is that I'm faithful to this. My prayer every week is that we wouldn't leave this place and go, hey, what did Heath have to say? Because I'm just going to be real with you. I've lived with Heath for 40 years. I don't care what Heath has to say. I want to know what God has to say. And if we want to know what God has to say, we got to pay attention to this. And so here is John saying what? Okay, I'm a herald. This isn't my message. This is the message of the king. And to prepare the pathway up to salvation, you cannot bypass repentance. Look at what he says here. Verse 3, a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. The literal translation of that phrase is this. Repentance, baptism. What is he saying? That before someone can enter into the waters of baptism, there must be a heart of what? Repentance. And so he's preaching that y'all are, flo- y'all are flooding to me, wanting to go into the waters of baptism. And he asks him straight up, why? Are you trying to run from the wrath? We're going to get to that in just a moment. Verse 7, are you trying to flee from the wrath of God? You're just coming to the water of baptism because you want the waters to cover you. You're, you're looking for fire insurance. Have you heard that before? You're looking for, you're, you're not seeking life change. You're not seeking a new heart to God. You're seeking not wanting to die and go to hell. But you can't bypass this. What does he say? It's the picture of what? Before someone enters into the waters of baptism, there must be a heart of repentance. I love our baptism services. But I reiterate again, even the message and the teaching of John to Jesus said, it's not the waters of baptism that saves us. It's the blood of Jesus that saves us. The waters of baptism, what? Symbolize that, show that, say that, profess that. But John says what? There must be repentance 
baptism. That before someone can even enter into the waters of baptism, there must be true repentance. Well, what is repentance? The true definition of repentance is what? A change of heart that results in a change of mind. That because God has accomplished this miracle in my life, I can't work up repentance. That's the work of God. I can't work up salvation. That's the work of God. But how it happens simultaneously, how God allows a, a, a sinner to recognize their sins before him, and in the midst of that, they recognize how little they bring to the table to solve their problem. So what does it do? It points us to a Savior. It's the brokenness of sin, recognizing I see it, God, the way you see it. What do I do about it? I can't fix it with religion. I can't fix it by just being baptized. I can't fix it by just uh, taking of the Lord's Supper. So what must I do? It's the surrender of a heart. I think about the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. In John 3... Nicodemus asked Jesus this question. It says this, This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God. He's affirming. He came from God. And he said this, For no one can do these signs unless God is with them. Jesus answered and said to him, I say to you, unless one is what? Born again. Well, that's confusing, right? Well, he says to Jesus, what do you mean I've already been born? And Jesus reiterates, well, we're not talking about a physical birth. I'm talking about a spiritual birth, that you are dead in your trespasses and sins, regardless of religion. You are dead in your trespasses and sins until a heart is repentant and by faith is raised by the power of God. You're lost in your sins. Look at what he says. Verse 4. There's a calling upon John to take the word of God and to do what? It says this, verse 4. Prepare the way of the Lord. How? Make his path straight. Fill in the valleys, every mountain be brought low, that the crooked places shall be made straight and the rough ways smooth. And so he acknowledges right there the work of God in the life of the individual, that a heart that truly repents and profess Christ as Savior, he says, listen, this is what happens. You can, you can see it, right? We're not saved by our actions, but we're known. The Bible says that, right? We're known by our fruit. We're not saved by our works, but we're known by them. And James says that, right? Faith without works is what? Say it with me. Faith without works is dead. We know we're not saved by our works. However, in a true child of God, if there's been a new birth, if there's been a new creation, if a heart has been raised to walk in newness of life, you will see a change in that person's life. And he says, this is how it looks. Every valley will be filled. Every low spot that's in our lives. It doesn't mean that we don't have struggles. It doesn't mean that we don't falter and, and stumble. That's not what it means. But it says that God comes into the heart of this individual and he lifts those valleys. The valley of bitterness. The valley of unforgiveness. The valley of addiction. The valley of guilt and shame. The valley of loneliness and despair. Through the power of God's work in the gospel of Jesus Christ, he fills every valley. You know, you've heard the statement, I've said it before. I've heard a pastor say years ago that God doesn't give you more than you can handle. And I remember sitting out there being so frustrated with that. Because I look at my own lives and I go, really? Because I can't handle this. Can I get an amen? You ever look at this stuff and go, really? I can't handle this. And as I went back and, you know, I've always been a challenger. I've always been that type of personality. My dad would preach something and I'd come home and already have my questions my dad, show me this and show me this and, and show me where it says I have to be home by 11. Like, I would challenge him, <laughs> show me a memory verse. And I remember hearing that and thinking to myself, I don't see that. And as you go through and you dig in God's word, you don't see that. Matter of fact, you see the exact opposite. And I've said this so many times before. You find in scripture that it's taught to us very clearly that clearly God gives us way more than we can handle. Way more than we can handle. So that we would recognize our insufficiencies in handling our lives. So that we would surrender our hearts and lives to him. So that we submit daily and say, God, I know what's coming in front of me. And I don't even know what's going to happen in the details of this afternoon. But I know what I'm dealing with now. And I am no match for it. And so, Lord, I once again, as I did initially in my repentant heart, turn to you. I once again turn to you, submit and surrender my life for the work that only you can do. Look at the next part. Every valley shall be filled. What does he say? Every mountain shall be brought down what is staring at you in the face today. What is the enemy lying at you today that is too big for your God to handle? What is it? Just answer it right now in your spirit. What is it in front of you today that the enemy wants to consume with you so that your eyes will be placed on it rather than the one who has conquered it? So that the mountains will be brought down. That the crooked places will be made straight. What does he say? The crooked places of our thoughts, the crooked places of our ways made straight through the dwelling of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That he smooths out the rough, rough edges is what he says. That through his word and through the power of his Holy Spirit, it's that process of sanctification. 
That yes, in that initial moment of repentance and faith, there's justification that through the, through the blood of Jesus, I stand justified before a holy God. But in the life of the believer, it is a lifelong journey of sanctification. Lord, you are faithful to complete the work that you've begun in me. If that encourages you, let me hear you say amen. Amen. He's faithful. Don't give up. He's not finished. Don't give up on your husband or wife. The Lord's not finished with them yet. They are a work in progress, right? We are in the process of sanctification, every single one of us. And so when we talk about repentance, this is not just something that happens once in the life of the, of the believer. This is a daily thing for us in our growth with the Lord. I love Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, sacrificial living daily. Holy, acceptable to God, which is your regional service. Do not be conformed to this world. Don't look like the world. But be transformed from the inside out. That's where we get the word metamorphosis. But be transformed from the inside out. How? Through a heart of repentance and faith, God changes us from the inside out. What does he say? That you may, be, that you may prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. Paul talks about the renewing of the mind. It's that constant growth of, Lord, let me see me the way you see me. Let me see others the way you see others. Let me see my struggles and my circumstances the way you see them. Let me see them not separate from your work in my life. Let let me see them as what you've led me to, you're going to lead me through. And as you lead me through it, there are things that you can only do in this moment. So Lord, keep me. But I acknowledge that, hey, this is beyond me. Lord, you've got to do this in me. So God, keep me clean. Keep me close. And if there's anything that arises in my heart, if there's anything that arises in my, in my life, may the alarms of the Holy Spirit go off that I may recognize and that I may once again repent, change of mind, turn from them, change of attitude, look at it upon it as you see it. And then what does he say? Verse 6, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. When I read that, I immediately go back to chapter 2. If you remember Simeon, Right, Simeon talking about the baby Jesus as he looks upon Jesus. He, he lifts his voice to the Lord. And he says, Lord, you will allow me to now what? Depart in peace because my eyes have seen salvation. John's been called to prepare the way, to preach repentance. And he says, in all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Jesus declares, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That is the message. We are the messengers. That is God's plan, and we are the messengers. Acts 4.12, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name given under heaven by which men must be saved. It's the name of Jesus. I want you to see what he does here, and then we're going to enter to the Lord's Supper. Go down to verse 7. And I want you to look in detail very quickly the message that he's preaching here. Because what he lays out for us basically in verse 7 through 20, if you're here today and you're like, man, yeah, I'm frustrated. I'm struggling. Man, same stuff in my life. It's like I take a step forward and I get not two steps back. I want to grow in Christ. I I, I want to see growth. You know, I I want to see, uh, you know, the the, the vices being broken, the chains. But I'm struggling. I'm frustrated. I'm discouraged. What, What does he do? He lays out for us right here the pathway to true repentance. Look at what he says. Look at verse 7. Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, brood of vipers. Well, that's not the greatest introduction in the world, okay, for your sermon. Um, not very seeker sensitive. But what is he doing? Matthew specifically tells us that he's speaking to the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And he calls them brood of vipers. Why? Why? Jesus says the same thing in Matthew 12, 34. He refers to them as brood of vipers. Why? You know what he's calling them? He's calling them, you are the sons of a poisonous snake. You are the son of who? Satan. All the religion in the world, you are still the son of Satan. You're not a part of the family of God. There's never been a heart change. You're practicing all this religion and even being a religious leader of the day. You're still a son of Satan because there's been no heart change. And so what does he preach right away? It's the personal recognition of our sins. That's the first thing he preaches on the pathway to repentance, to recognize our sins, to see our sins before God, not to compare them to someone else, not to say, well, I'm better than them, and I'm better than them, and I've never done that, but to see ourselves not at other people's standards, but to see ourselves at God's standards. And the Bible says what? If we've committed one sin, then we're guilty of them all. The Bible says even the greatest righteousness is of filthy rags without a heart change. So he says what? The first step in repentance is seeing your sins to recognize, yes, I am outside of a relationship with God. Yes, I am a son of disobedience. And then what does he say next? Look at the next part of verse 7. 
He says, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? So there's now the second step. Not only is it a recognition of my sins before God, it's a recognition of the judgment of God. Okay, not only am I guilty before a holy God, but God is a God of love, yes, but God is a God of justice. God is a holy God. And so he says, listen, you want to walk this pathway to salvation? You cannot skip the road of repentance. And the road of repentance recognizes, first of all, that I'm a sinner before a holy God. It then recognizes that I serve, yes, a loving God, but that I serve a holy God, a judging God. And then look at the next part. As you move a little bit further in this, he says this. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. He's looking upon these who are Jewish people, even Jewish religious leaders. And he says, listen, don't tell me you're a son of Abraham. God can make sons of Abraham out of these rocks right here. There ain't nothing special about you. That's basically what John is saying. If your heart has never been changed to Christ, you stand just as guilty before holy God. Doesn't matter your heritage. Doesn't matter your lineage. Doesn't matter what your great grandma did. Doesn't matter if your grandma loved Jesus. We will all stand individually before the throne of God. He says, listen, even as ancestors of Abraham, he says right up front, right, baptism, why are you coming to be baptized? Because baptism doesn't save you. It's a heart of repentance that saves you. He says, listen, these steps of repentance is an honest reflection of personal sin. It's a recognition of divine wrath. It's the rejection of religious rituals such as baptism or, or any ordinance by means of salvation. It's a rejection of salvation by means of heritage. And then what? It's acknowledging and professing the one by which salvation is found. Verse 16. John answered, saying to all, Indeed, I baptize you with water, but one, Jesus, who is mightier than I, is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to lose, he will baptize you, not just with water, but with the Holy Spirit and fire. And I tell you, as I was preparing this message this past week, I'm just going to tell you what the Lord asked me. I felt like the Lord was just saying, Heath, when's the last time you shed a tear of your sins? prepare a message every Sunday and you stand up and you declare God's word when's the last time you took a true look of the view God has of your life and your sins you know, this repentance right you can't bypass it initially unto salvation but in our walk with Christ you can't bypass it really a, a child of the believer should be a life of repentance right I mean, the more we walk with Christ, the more we should hate our sins. The more we walk with Jesus, the more we should see them for what they are and the damage that is caused in our families, in our marriages, in our children. To say, Lord, don't let me play with stuff. Don't let me play with stuff. Don't, don't let me just, 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 just go through the motions of things because, Lord, there is a battle that is raging every day, a battle for my home, a battle for my children, and battle for generations to come. So may I see it the way you see it. And may I be broken over the things where the enemy has placed a foothold. With every head bowed and every eye closed. John preaches the message of Christ, the message of Paul, the message of Peter. By grace you have been saved through faith, yes. But it's a heart of repentance that leads us to a profession of faith. It's a heart of crying out, God, I am spiritually bankrupt. That's what Jesus says when he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. I am spiritually bankrupt. I bring nothing to the table. John says, even to the religious leaders of Judaism, you are spiritually bankrupt before a holy God. And it's Jesus alone that saves us. We're going to gather around this table. I can't think of a better day in this moment, in this time. Man, if you're here today and you've never had that initial act of repentance and crying out into salvation, listen again, that's the work of God in your life. If God is leading you and drawing you, man, I encourage you just right here, you and the Lord, just you and God, to cry out, God, I, I recognize my sins. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. And I recognize I'm no match for my sins. I have no power over my sins, so I declare Jesus. I turn from my sins. I change my mind about my sins, my direction, and I call upon a Savior. God, I know that's got to be your work in me. 
It's not something that can be accomplished in determination or willpower. That has to be your Holy Spirit living inside of me. The truth of your word shapes and molds me, cuts me, matures me to see my life the way you see my life. And as believers, we gather around this table this morning, acknowledging what Christ has done, but also in this moment of presence, saying, Lord, search me. If there's anything there, Lord, may I turn from it, may I repent of it. As Paul says, do not take of the elements in an unworthy manner. But it's also expectation of what is to come. Christ is returning. He has commissioned us as his church that as we gather around this table to do this in remembrance of him. My Heavenly Father, Lord, as we ask your blessings upon these elements, Lord, we pray you bless the bread that symbolizes the body that was broken for our sins. Lord, we pray that you would bless the cup that symbolizes the blood that was shed for our sins. And as your word says, without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. And so, Lord, may you create in us a heart of repentance, a consistent heart of repentance. It's just walk in you to stay centered upon you. Lord, may you be glorified in this time. We pray it, we ask it in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. new things. Now, Lord, make me a better person. Make me a new person, a new creation. Create in me, Lord, new desires, new passions, new priorities. 
center me upon the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that as Christ gathered with those disciples, he took of these elements. As he gathered in that Passover meal, he told them, he said, the bread represents the body. So Isaiah told us 700 years earlier, by his bruises, we are saved. Jesus said, those who eat, take and eat of this bread shall have eternal life. And in like manner, he took the cup, the new covenant, new things, the new covenant came to fulfill the old, but to bring the new. By the blood of Jesus, we are saved. We are set free. And we're born again. Those who drink of this cup shall have eternal life. Amen. God is good. Amen. I want to invite you to stand at this time. Join with me if you would as we go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we lift high the name of Jesus. We lift high, Lord, the new things that you create in us. And so, Lord, we thank you that, Lord, you came to us seeking us, lost, dead in our trespasses and sins, raised to walk in newness of life. Lord, we recognize that is your work in us. So, Lord, as we leave this place today, Lord, may we leave this place today changed, and may you continue to change us as we go throughout the day, that, Lord, we would see it the way you see it, that we would recognize truly what you've done for us. Thank you for Jesus. May Christ be glorified by what we say, by what we do, and as we leave this parking lot, in Jesus' name, as we leave this parking lot, amen. Have a good afternoon.